Good morning. It is with great pleasure that I have the honor of introducing Governor Robert E. Wise, known to West Virginians as Bob. Bob has dedicated his life to public service, much of it advancing education opportunities for public school children. Bob was born and grew up in Kanawha County. He attended George Washington Public High School in Charleston, where he competed in track and field. The competitive spirit that led him to half mile and mile races was an indication of the energy he would bring to a long career in public service. Bob is a graduate of Duke University and the Tulane University School of Law. After he graduated from law school, Bob returned to West Virginia and opened his first law practice in Charleston. While starting law practice, he dove into public interest work. Bob lent his expertise and energy to West Virginians for a fair and equitable assessment of taxes, a citizens group that advocated for property tax reform. Those taxes helped fund public schools and libraries. In 1980, Bob was elected to the West Virginia Senate. He was endorsed by the West Virginia Education Association and other labor organizations. Bob served as a member of Congress from 1983 until 2001. During his 18-year tenure in Congress, Bob served on the House Committee on Education and Labor. He focused on improving financial aid for college students and early childhood development programs. Bob was then elected governor of the state of West Virginia. As governor, he was able to move forward with his education agenda, fighting for and signing into law legislation that fu funded the Promise Scholarship Program. Promise has enabled thousands of West Virginia high school graduates to continue their education in the Mountain State. During his administration, West Virginia saw a significant increase in the number of students completing high school and entering college. As governor, Bob also implemented comprehensive early childhood education programs. Bob recently completed 14 years as president of the Alliance for Ed Excellent Education, a national nonprofit dedicated to ensuring that all students graduate from high school ready for success in college and work. Bob's accomplishments include leading the development of Future Ready Schools, a network of 3,300 school districts committed to the effective use of digital learning to assist teachers and improve student learning outcomes. He launched an adolescent learning initiative to guide education policy and practice decisions. While president of Alliance, Bob authored the book, Raising the Grade, How High School Reform Can Save Our Youth and Our Nation. Bob is a prominent speaker and advisor on education issues and trends. He has advised the U.S. Department of Education, the White House, and key state and federal policymakers. He also holds a black belt in Taekwondo. Again, it is my great pleasure to welcome Bob to the West Virginia University College of Law. So here's Bob. Thank you very much, Professor. And it is true. I, boy, you've done some research. I can see why you're so good and, and have been all these years um, uh, clerking in, in law and, and academe. Is that you knew that I did track and field. So why did I do track and field? Actually, some, this sum, sum, summarizes my whole presentation. I did track and field because I couldn't do football. I wasn't qualified. I couldn't do basketball. You've ever tried to play center at 5'10", uh, 110 pounds? It turned out that in terms of my particular athletic, which I also can equate to learning, needs, track and field was what I was suited for. And that's what, so here's my one-liner. You can go get coffee now if you want, because uh, where I think we ought to be focusing, whether it's litigation policy or whatever, is what are the individual learning needs that each student has? And that, to me, is the progression of Pauli. How's that for a succinct argument, Professor? Um, so, but you don't get away that easily. So let me talk some, because Pauli, the 40th anniversary of Pauli is actually, as I started doing some research and reflecting, uh, it occurred to me that Pauli is an odyssey. It's an odyssey for, in the law, it's an odyssey for education, and it was a personal odyssey. So let me mix it all in. The, the Pauli case, um, is, a, is some extremes for me. I was, a, I was on the plaintiff's side, an expert witness in the Pauli case, 
when uh, the Pauley decision came down, Judge Recht was appointed as a special judge and he held 40 days of hearings. I was an expert witness on the subject of property taxes. We'll get to how come Bob got to know about property taxes shortly. But I was an expert witness on property tax, so I was on the plaintiff's side. 20 some years later, I'm the defendant as the governor of the state of West Virginia, and I signed on, off on the final order that Judge Recht issued. So I've, I've been on all, it's a perfect, Judge Starcher, you'll appreciate this, it's been a perfect political situation. I was on all sides at one point or the other. But it also presented challenges too, and maybe that's if I could talk about some because as you do litigation, it does present challenges that are outside the courtroom. The challenges of implementation, the challenges of even when it's right, but if you're an economy that's in a tailspin at the time and you're being called upon and to uh, expend significant amounts of money. Uh, so there were lots of challenges, and I do want to note and recognize, and um, as I did last night, I want to recognize the Supreme Court of Appeals in 1979 that issued the Pauley decision, but also then set in motion uh, the special judge uh, and mastery of Judge Recht, uh, who I think may be one of the finest jurists uh, that I've ever run across, but also who over time, over the 20-some years of this case, was constantly was coming to grips with not only what was happening in education, but what was happening in the state, and how could he move forward and at the same time take that into consideration. So there are three, to me, there are three main periods in the Pauli case. First was 1979 when the Supreme Court took it up, remanded it uh, uh, back, uh, said the circuit court in Kanawha County was wrong, and appointed Judge Rex. So 1979. Second period was 1982. That's after 40 days of hearings, Judge Arthur Recht issues, I believe, a 244-page opinion uh, and, and sets in motion a judicial, legislative, and political process. Indirectly, I'm in, I was in politics because of the Pauley case, because the furor that came out of the Pauley case, and then subsequently Judge Recht, um, uh, launched a movement teachers, teacher led, but others as well, to elect public officials that would, would represent what they thought was important in education. And I, I won a state senate seat on that, in that period, as did several others. The state senate actually flipped control, not Democrat to Republican, but, but flipped the philosophical control based upon the Pauley case. And then the third period, so we've got 79, we have Judge Rex's first decision, in uh, 1982, and then we have Judge Recht revisiting the case. Remember, it's been open for all these years. Uh, Ma uh, Master was appointed, the State Department of Education was assigned to develop a plan, the legislature went and made several attempts at addressing it. And then the plaintiffs in the Pauley case, by this time the Pauleys had aged out, uh, uh, the plaintiffs in the Pauley case came back in, in the case Tomlin, the uh, Lincoln County Commission, they found new uh, plaintiffs, said not, not enough has been done and pressed Judge Recht to uh, continue along the same direction he's been and to order new funding in certain areas. And at this point, Judge Recht said no. Uh, he, he wa and so there, in my book, there's while there are two to three significant developments in the Pauley case over the 20-some 20, 20 years, there are really two during the Pauley case, there are two generations of education changes that took place, and we're now in our third. And so I also want to address some about the third. Uh, the, text, the test of a case to me is not in its immediate impact, but its relevancy and its ability to be relevant and to be, continue its relevancy in changing times. And I'm, I've just mentioned the periods that the Pauley case went through. There's some constants in the Pauley case, so let me just point out what those are. We referenced earlier the eight principles that the Supreme Court enunciated in 1979. In terms of today's education, they're not necessarily in the right priority list. They're a bit clunky in their wording, they're not sophisticated, but I'm gonna hang on to them, because I can work with them. Uh, the one that I think is most significant in terms of reflecting what needs to be built from the Pauley case is the one that I'm actually emphasizing, although I think it was number five, and that is self-knowledge and self-knowledge of the total environment to allow the child to intelligently choose life work. 
to know his or her options. I need to extrapolate a little bit on this, and you'll hear this theme throughout the rest of my remarks. To me, what that is, is we have to be continuing to prepare our students to learn how to learn. Simply learning math facts, how to multiply and divide, that's one of the constants in here. Simply learning literacy, key core competencies. They are no longer sufficient. You have to be able to do, be engaged in critical thinking, creative thinking. You have to be able to collaborate. You have to be able to synthesize. Everything that you learn in law school about taking four or five facts and then synthesizing a conclusion, that's what now is commonplace in almost every aspect of the workforce, from the most traditional, uh, from the most traditional to the most uh, transformational industry. I say all this because I'm not here as a jurist. I started down the road with the Pauli case as a witness, as, as, as a lawyer, yes, as, as um, was mentioned. But I want to speak to you more as later a politician. I happen to think that the term politician can be an honorable term. It comes from the Greek poli, those who administer the city or state. It seems to me to be a pretty honorable way. Got abused along the way a little bit. Uh, the last 2,000 years, and then, uh, and then also as an advocate, because in the last 14 years, I just retired, or did not retire, I've re repotted, um, I'm rejuvenating, but in the last 14 years, as head of the Alliance for Excellent Education, uh, I have been an advocate. I wish I had known, what I've learned in the last 14 years, I wish I had known as governor, uh, because I would have been a lot better for education, but be that as a way, and I do want to recognize my colleague, Graduate of the law school, just stepped off the advisory board for the law school, Chip Slavin, who's still with the Alliance for Excellent Education, Chip. Um, so, there are some other findings in the Pauli case that are also constant, and then I'm going to get to what's changing. The, the finding in 1979 that the future of West Virginia depends upon the quality of its education system. It was important then, as a, friend of my, as a high school classmate of mine said, that was before 1979, as a high school classmate of mine noted to me one time, education is the only passport from poverty. It was true in 1966. It is really true in 2019. This state's economic future, its future in a lot of other ways too, depends upon the quality of its education system. And the fact, it's not only the quality, it is the fact that who is, the, what it is able to do for its students and how its students are benefiting. Pauli and Judge Recht uh, and, and Kel and, and, uh, noted that. Also, the definition, and this is another constant, the definition of a thorough and efficient education must be ready to adapt to changing economic and social times. In, in Pauli's day, we had 50-some thousand coal miners. Today, we have, I believe, we're somewhere around 13 to 15,000. Might, I might add, they're mining far more coal than they did because of technology, surface mining, and other things. But the, in, in the Pauli year, in 1979, we were still uh, the height of manufacturing, mining uh, uh, industries. Shortly thereafter, they began to take a decline, and they never came back, and particularly in, ma in manufacturing. But so what, what Pauli tells us, even then, is, and then Judge Recht in 82, is that it is education and the economy are going to be facing constant changes. So, from, so some valuable lessons from the Pauli case. First of all, it's been stated earlier, elect, elections matter. I'm going to submit to you that there are two places that critical education decisions are made. One, the thousands of decisions in West Virginia that are made every day in classrooms by classroom teachers affecting their students. Looking at data uh, uh, and analyzing who's doing what, what, what does this child need, what does that child need, speaking to a parent. Those are critical decisions. That's one form. The second form is every important decision and often unimportant decisions in education will be acted upon by an elected official. A local school board member, sir, you were talking earlier, the state, board, uh, the state board member who is appointed by an elected official, confirmed by an elected official, Judge Recht and the Supreme Court are elected officials. Uh, the, the member of the United States Congress who enacts the next piece of federal legislation, the President of the United States and so on, every important decision is ultimately passed upon by an elected official in education. Education is a political process. Don't try and say it's not. What you want to try to do is to make it work. So 
And that was, a, so understanding that because that means that litigation has consequences. And certainly we saw that in Pauli and we also saw it in a, a somewhat companion case. I argued with several other public interest advocates also ruled on in 1979, Tug Valley Recovery versus Mingo County Commission, which upheld that a third party in a county, a taxpayer in a county, had the right to go and challenge somebody else's assessment as being too low. In this case, we were challenging mineral companies, <coughs> mineral owners, for ha having their coal holdings assessed at under what their value was. At the same time, homeowners were being assessed at a much higher level. Supreme Court upheld that right, that a third party could challenge, and Judge Reck then used that in Pauley, or in, in Pauley and then in his decision to talk about how there were additional sums available to support education because 70% of the property tax dollar goes to education. So, but the, so I, what was the political impact? I was four year, five years out of law school. I thought, I've been to the state Supreme Court. We just, three of us just argued this case and we just won. This thing's gonna stand forever. And I learned how long it could stand. It could stand three months until the next legislative session when folks ran back to change the st to who lost to change the statute to what they wanted it to say. We were able to put together a grassroots coalition that beat them back, but that told me where the power also lay. And so we're litigation and politics and, and elections, um, have, they work with hand in hand with one another. So, Another lesson when it comes to education is that, and this is one I've really learned the last 14 years, I've, is that maintaining the traditions of previous eras, because our system of education um, goes back essentially to the University of Bologna about 800 years ago. I just might want to say, you know, we're sitting in an amphitheater, the seats are better cushioned, it's a little more climate controlled. This is what they were doing 800 years ago. And so, you saw that video of the uh, before the teacher panel. Did you note something that was very significant when that student said, what makes a difference to us is we're not sitting in rows. We're sitting in groups and we're learning from one another. Still traditional values in the sense of a quality teacher who understood what needed to be done, but the pedagogy had been ad ad adapted to reflect what current, what the learning needs really are. And so, to me, so what, that's what learning in education, and that's what I think is important about Pauli, is that we have to recognize that what's been traditional and what we may have grown up on is not necessarily what is what required now for this next generation. I, when I, um, and Suzanne, I know you were never involved, the professor, I know you were never involved in this, but when I, when I was doing the research on my case in 79, I did something, I shepherdized. Now, I asked one of you last night, because I haven't been in a law school in 40 years. I asked one of you last night, uh, Stephen, I asked one of you if you'd shepherd. I said, oh, yeah. I said, yeah, you just go right, you know, Lexus Nexus. There was no Lexus Nexus. I'm talking about, <laughs> Professor, if I go in the law library, are there still the long, they don't still print those long volumes of books, the shepherdizing. I could, I, I could go down, I could open that volume up. It was all, it was all, volumes that were somehow tracked to one another. And I could shepherd, I, I was so proud I could go and be in the Supreme, state Supreme Court library and go quicker than almost anybody going. And, you, and it would only take me a, f, uh, a few hours and then a few days and you will have it in a minute and a half. <laughs> so, but, but think about how then learning, that's not only an aid to learning, that's changing learning. So it's the need to recognize that education is constantly changing. And once again, Judge Recht, in that third decision from 1982 to 2003, recognizes that. Because what was the original Recht decision about? It was about inputs. It was about what it was that would constituted a thorough and efficient education as defined by what the system that you build. I'm looking at, I am looking at some great jurors. I see uh, Justice Cleckley. Uh, back on the wall. I'm trying to think whether he sat on that bench at that time. Anyway, and it was squ how many square foot feet per student? What what was going to what did the gymnasium have to look like? 
laying out detail by detail what had to be in that system of education. That's 1982. Now flash forward to 2003 and the Pauli decision. And because and what's taken place, and it was referred to earlier by some of our earlier panels, is we've moved from an input system to actually looking what's happening to students. What are the outcomes? And so all these, the inputs may be valuable, and some of them are essential. I, mean, I remember walking through one, to one school, visiting one school in a rural county that was the subject of um, my litigation, and there was raw sewage running, running in front of it. And you go inside, and it was just an abysmal, abysmal building. Yes, there should be some inputs dictated there. What's safe and healthy? But what about the learning outcomes? What's happening, what is actually happening to those students? And so during the time that Judge Reck ruled the first time and the second time, we went through, whether you call it standards-based reform, performance-based uh, accountability or whatnot. And so the result was that by the time Judge we get to 2003, the, the focus has shifted to not what, what are the inputs, but what are the output, what's the outcome. And I, th I would submit to you that we're now in a third generation, and I may get to talk about that a little bit in a minute, where there's actually a combination of the two. But, but, but in, when Judge Reck issued that first decision in 1982, um, it obviously it invoked raising and spending additional funds, a lot of them. And in that one, money mattered. Money matters now, too, don't get me wrong. But money was the main thing. And now you, when you look to 2003, and he revisits his decision in Tomlin v. W. West Virginia Board of Education and reflects the standards-based movement. Now, I know this weekend, this Friday, right? So you could do Netflix and all of that, but you don't. Here's the binge reading you want to do. You want to do binge reading. You want to read 244 pages of Judge Rex's decision in 82. Then f go forward and pick up Tomlin in, in 2003, much shorter. But, but you will, it will give you a complete picture, as only Judge Rex could write, a complete picture of the evolution of education. Let me quote from Judge Rex in Tomlin. The performance-based accountability approach is designed to spend and allocate resources where they are most needed instead of allocating resources at the beginning of this educational cycle with the hopeful expectation that the results will achieve the highest quality standard of education. This front-end approach was the underlying premise of the master plan only because clear and convincing evidence submitted during hearings between August 1981 and January 1982 allowed no other conclusion. Think of that evolution that had taken place in both his mind as well as in education in the state and particularly nationally. The line of rec decisions shows a careful balancing of constitutional requirements with, uh, with current context. For 20 years, as I mentioned, the standards movement had been building. Uh, it culminated, Judge Rector issued this in 2003. It happened, the standards movement uh, culminated federally with No Child Left Behind being enacted in, I believe it was 2001 or early 2002, bipartisan agreement. Most significant involvement in some people's terms, intrusion in others, uh, in, uh, by the federal government into state and local activities uh, in decades. And some would argue, and I would argue in some cases, overly prescriptive. But I would also say that without this, what No Child Left Behind will do for you if you choose to get involved in edu education litigation or even education policy, it provides you access to data that we otherwise didn't have. Because never before did we look at what was happening to individual subgroups within a school. We would look at the school, good news, XYZ high school has an 85% high school graduation rate. What you didn't see was that there was a significant group, students of race or color, students with disability, students, uh, low income students in a uh, largely middle income to upper income school that were either dropping out or, or, not, not, gra or not succeeding. I, I remember visiting a US senator one time 
taking to him a list of what we call dropout factories. They were graduating less than 60% of students. One of them was his school, his high school that he graduated from. And he looked at it and said, oh, I love this school. It's wonderful. We sent, I went to Harvard, so and so. Here's the staff person. She went to uh, uh, Brown. Wasn't it a wonderful school? He never realized he had two schools within a school. He had one school that was white, essentially, and he had another that was black. And, once, and one group of students went to the AP courses, and the other group of students dropped out. And the data mass, masked it. Now that, that doesn't happen because now subgroups are accounted. And so, so that's, that has been one of the, and so that No Child Left Behind comes along just as Judge Recht is wrapping up his decision. Um, I, don't th I don't know whether he fully appreciated what it was gonna mean, but he could see the direction that things were going. The, 2003 REC decision also seemed to balance economic realities with what would be achieved, against what would be achieved. And I'll give you an example. Remember, the eight, uh, 1898, that's me. Um, remember, uh, 1982 was about inputs and money. And a lot of back and forth in the legislature about how much this is going to cost and constant tug and pressure. In, 19, in 2003, the plaintiffs come back, or 2002, the plaintiffs come back and they not only want, they want um, uh, more, a r more rigorous master plan, but they also want the judge to order more money yet to be spent and added to the county formula, basically around transportation. I want to read, Judge Reck declines, and I want to read to you the language, because this also reflects the shift that has taken place since 1979. Judge Recht writes, he declines a plaintiff's request to mandate an additional $43 million, stating that, what, quote, what the evidence did not establish, however, is that while the formula adjustment would infuse much needed financial resources to each county, the failure to affect the formula adjustment would not result in the inability to provide a thorough and efficient system of public education as required. He's asking now for justification that the additional funds will make a difference, as opposed to, to simply saying this, this we need, it, it, is prefer, it is desirable to have this kind of additional money for transportation in the county formulas. Why did that make a difference? It made a big difference to me, because I was governor, and we were entering the worst recession since the previous worst recession when uh, in 1981 or two, and we had just given the largest pay raise uh, that to teachers that had been, they had gotten, that was my first year, uh, thank you, gray machines, that the largest, um, uh, you know, some of you know what I'm talking about, um, the largest pay raise to teachers uh, that they'd received in probably a decade, and we were on t online to give another one, and then the recession hit. And West Virginia is slower going into a recession, and it's slower coming out. And so what we realized was that in the next year, we weren't going to be able to give that pay raise, but we were going to have to freeze salaries. Every, in that point, every $20, $20 million represented 1% pay raise uh, a year. That $43 million, not only would we not have, didn't have it for pay raises, but we would have had to have taken it out of some other aspect uh, of, of functioning. Probably higher ed, to be quite frank with you, because K-12 is constitutionally protected. And so what I appreciated about the judge was him saying, if you can't show me that it's going to make a difference, and that it, it, then I'm, I'm going to decline to order it. And so I think at that point, some economic reality and impact was setting in as well. So the Pauli case was filed in one educational and economic context. It was finally settled in another, and now exists in a third, and now there's a third. And so let me talk about that, because that also reflects where I've been the last 15 years, essentially. So what students needed to know in 1979 and what they learned and how they learned were vastly different. Think about it. There was no internet. Little focusing on, actually, three, three if you didn't have cable, still new, 
You didn't have cable. There were three network stations, one public TV station. That was it. And they signed off at midnight. I know it's hard to believe. Trust me. Um, so what st students needed to know in 1979 was vastly different. There was a little focusing on how to meet the needs of each student. We treated students as a, a group, a block, your class. Ergo, this is what happens. There was no clear understanding that post-secondary education would be necessary. The thing that mattered, you had a library, you cared about how many books were in the library. There was no uh, internet search engines. Graduating from high school meant a student, according to a Harvard study that I like to cite, graduating from high school in those days meant a student already had 50 to 70 percent of what they would need for their lifetime success. 50 to 70 percent by having that high school diploma. And while economic change was soon to come to West Virginia in a very hard and dramatic way, manufacturing immediately, chemical and steel went through, and the rest of the country too, but uh, the rest of the country caught a cold and we got an extreme virus because uh, uh, we were so dependent upon manufacturing steel and extraction. And when it came through, it came through with a vengeance. Governor Rockefeller, then Governor Rockefeller, 1976 to, or 1977 to 1981 first term, he presided over the fastest growing economy in the country. 1981 to 1985, he presided over 24% unemployment. And so you can see the, the massive changes that were coming uh, in 1979, and also the learning differences. Now, let's go to 2003. Internet, well established uh, for commerce, communications, and learning. Online learning was developing. I remember giving the commencement speech. Anybody here from uh, uh, Pickens? Randolph County? So I gave the commencement, just start your, I suspect you may have given one of these. Uh, I gave the commencement speech at Pickens High School. Uh, I had, uh, if those of you who know that area, it's one of the most remote spots of West Virginia. You go up a 25 miles, up a couple of incredible mountains, to three communities where there are incredible people. And I gave a commencement speech and I had a graduating class of two. They told me if I came back next year, it actually double, was doubling to four. <laughs> and with it, the joke was everybody gets to be valedictorian or salutatorian. <laughs> what impressed me, and that's not, what impressed me about that commencement speech was there were two people, grad, two students graduating, a hundred and some people in the audience. They weren't all relatives. Those were, the three com those were the three communities coming together and saying, we're how proud we are of you. But as I walked out of that commencement speech, thinking how remote we are, I said to the principal, eh, how in the world do you get, I, I guess you, there's so much you're not able to provide, K-12 school, pre-K-12 school. And I said, particularly languages, how in the world do you get good language, uh, any language instruction here? He said, well, what are you talking about? He said, I have one of the finest Spanish instructors in the country. And I said, here? And he, he pointed to a satellite dish, a little old technology then, pointed to a satellite dish and said, she comes in every morning at 10 o'clock from San Antonio. And so we were beginning to see in that, since 2003, we were beginning to see the development of technology that offered, that enhanced teaching, not replacing it. You will not replace, nor should you try, what, what a, the human teacher provides, because it's, there's an empathetic and quality teacher is the single greatest determinant of success, school-based success in, the in, um, uh, in a school. But technology has the ability to provide and assist that teacher. As one superintendent said to me one time, you came to see our technology, and it was a pretty sophisticated operation, he said, that's not what we're about. We're about the teaching. And you ought to know that what we look at this technology doing is it enables our teachers to be professionals. Everyone is now, and I love these words, an educational designer because they have the data so that your learning needs and your learning needs and your learning needs are now, a teacher can deal with each one of them individually as opposed to treating us all as a group. Anybody like to go to a doctor and they say, well, let's see, Bob, you're X amount, you're 70 years old, so I'm gonna treat you, I've got a whole, here's a whole lot of data on 70-year-olds overall, you probably got bad knee, you got a bad hip. Um, I'd just as soon you looked at the data on me, thank you. And I do have bad knees. But I do, what else is good about me? And what, is, what are the things that we need to focus on for me versus what we need to focus on for the next 70-year-old and so on? And so that's what technology has the capability of doing. 
enhancing teachers. And, and sometimes a bad term, data-driven decision-making, you really want to make, if, if you're going to represent me, I hope you're using the best possible data as you make your decisions about w whatever legal and, and, uh, venture we're in. And so I th it's the same thing needs to be true for education. And we have that capacity much more now today than we did then. So let's think, so back to the learning needs for 2003, or the learning, or post-2003. Um, so now let's go to, let's see, you're all, so a first grader who enters in 2003. The, the Pauli case has been resolved, Judge Recht has signed the final order, and now you enter, a, a West Virginia student enters school. What have they seen since 2003? Their schools may have libraries, but every one of you here who's a student looks to Google as your main search engine and where you acquire knowledge. And you will for the rest of your lives to whatever the next, the next variation is going to be. Um, broad brand access is not a luxury anymore, it's a prerequisite. And in fact, the federal government is working in, at, under a mandate that 99% of all classrooms, 99% of all students have access to broadband within their schools. We're not there yet, but we're getting much closer. And then, and then the ability to extend it, and this becomes even harder in West Virginia with our terrain, but the ability to extend it to homes, because it's pretty tough. Uh, uh, if you have the most modern technology and learning opportunities in school, and then to go home, uh, and not have the same access. So how to accommodate that, or at least how to, adapt, how to adopt the strategies so that perhaps you're taking home a hardwired computer with certain information on it and you're coming back and you're using the internet uh, for other learning experiences. Anyway, the, um, I think what else that student sent who went, came in the first grade in 2003 is, has, is seeing. Um, Facebook, smartphones. 2008 was the smartphone, 2008, 2010 was when the first tablets came out. Chromebooks, social media, increased interac interactivity of technology. I, I went to school and, the, and we, our technology is we'd see a video. Okay, that's a one, you, you, some of you may have taken an online course but you, it was asynchronous, you didn't get to interact with the person. Today, the technology is about interaction and soon we're moving into the world of artificial intelligence and in, in a number of other areas as well. And so learning is an incredible new experience. And remember that statistic from when I graduated from high school and you'd 70, I, 50 to 75% of the knowledge was already acquired that I needed to be successful in life. Today, it's two, 2%. Two and so the issue isn't, the other piece of it is if human written knowledge doubles every five years, that's a conservative estimate now, then since 2003, 2008, 13, well, we're now, we've, we've doubled three times. And yet, I gotta be honest with you, my brain hasn't increased correspondingly. It should be hanging down over, <laughs> lobes over my ears. Um, and so what that means is that this is not just about knowledge acquisition, it's about, it, it, it's not just about knowledge memorization and retention, it's about acquisition and how to acquire. And the reality also is that where I was gonna be re-educated in 1979, three times during the course of my career, you're gonna to need to be retrained in some way 10 to 12 times by the time you're 40. And so what we're talking about in a thorough and efficient education today in West Virginia and across the country is about lifelong learning and preparing a student always to be able to learn. You're gonna, I talked to some of you last night, I understand you're taking the bar exam, chill. Um, you, you're gonna be doing a lot, uh, but that, that's just the start. And because you're gonna be constantly now uh, learning, uh, and, but you're not the only ones. So if I could um, I, and come back to just a moment about the importance of critical thinking, creative communication and collaboration. Those weren't referenced a great deal in the Pauli decision. Interestingly enough, if you took a survey of the Forbes 500 companies back in the early 80s, they would pretty much list what in the Kelly, I'm sorry, what in Pauli the Supreme Court listed as the priorities in the order they listed them. Core academic content knowledge, uh, ability to do sums, uh, and so on. Today, the order has flipped. And core academic content knowledge is still important, don't get me wrong. You, 
if you're going to synthesize, you're going to have something, some knowledge to start synthesizing with. But now what an employer is looking for is the ability to create, to communicate critical thinking. And that goes from the most traditional industry to the most uh, transformational. I visited a coal mine when I was leaving office in 2004. They were hiring 140 new miners for deep mine. And I asked the owner, what is the education level of your, most of your new miners? And he said, everybody has high school and most have post-secondary. And I looked at him and he said, he said, Bob, he said, if you think I'm letting somebody get a mile underground with a half million dollar piece of technical equipment, you're crazy without post-secondary. And so 12th grade is, is no longer uh, uh, the goal. And that's just a personal plug. And I don't know whether this was in the plan that the uh, legislators were considering or not. We're, we've, we're all focused on grade levels. I'm going to make you a prediction that in 10 years, grade levels are going to be increasingly obsolete. And that you're, we're going to see the seamless when we need of competency-based advancement. So a student advancing based upon what they, the mastery they demonstrate versus how old they are and what grade that, that requires them to sit in. The other thing is uh, we have 180 days uh, required K-12 uh, that you stay in, you be in a seat, that's called seat time, in order to get a degree. I, I don't know, was, anybody bought a car recently? Did you go and ask him, I want to know how, long, how many days it take to make, make this car? Or did you say, what's the quality of this car? So we have the ability and that in where learning is going to be going and where thorough and efficient education is going to have to rise or fall on is the ability to determine mastery, not uh, simply seat time and other arbitrary, uh, what, what is increasingly arbitrary. A um, couple other statistics, I love data, that that student from started in 2003, 65% uh, of, of those children entering school today are, are entering school and being prepared for six, I'm sorry, 65% of the jobs that these students will be filling, we don't know what they are. They haven't been created yet, but they will be. And so once again, you can't, we can't be training people for a particular task that they're gonna undertake all their lives. We're gonna have to be training them for a certain types of occupations and then the ability for them to continue educating themselves. And finally, I've got this study, uh, I always like Georgetown University Institute reported that when the Great Recession ended in 2000, in 2010, there were 11 point, in that five year period afterwards, 2010 to 2015, there were 11.6 million new jobs created in this country. 99% of them went to people with more than a high school diploma. High school diploma or less is 1%. So it's not, once again, it's not necessarily saying a two-year degree, a four-year degree, law school, med school, whatever degree. It is saying post-secondary is vital. And so once again, what's a thorough and efficient education? It's preparing students for the next level of education. And then, and this goes to, I think it was perhaps your discussion and others, which is legislatures have to understand that if you're going to mandate higher standards, which you need to mandate, you need to recognize, at the same time, this is not a process that stops at 12th grade, stops in, uh, with an AV degree. It's a process that's ongoing. And so a thorough and efficient education is going to involve a lot more than what Pauli was. So anybody interested in some future litigation? I got some thoughts for you. Um, first of all, the remember, remember that the definition of a thorough and efficient education uh, has to reflect current student learning needs. And this means a set of standards for high, high standards. All, all states have now gone to college and career ready. They're still trying to figure out exactly what that means, but they understand that, that that's essential. The second point I would make is that the original REC decision was about inputs, square footage, dollars spent. To the extent that inputs are important, I think we ought to be looking at a different set of inputs. What's necessary, what will be necessary for any le modern learning environment? We had a panel on teachers, so let's talk about teachers. Treating teachers as professionals and providing not only adequate salaries, 
but also the highest quality professional learning experiences. What is it that this, this, school, this school, this law school, as most law schools across the country, gets a lot of attention. It's, a, it's always one of the things that a university points to, the law school, the med school, the College of Engineering, and so on, uh, College of Arts and Sciences. What about the School of Education? Because the School of Education is what's preparing, uh, uh, preparing the teachers that will affect all of us. I was in office uh, only a short time when I learned, and I was all about economic development, every governor is, and we developed, and Chris, or Chip can tell you this, we developed a swag. You couldn't walk into West Virginia without me giving you something if you were an employer. I mean, we had new tax incentives. We had, I don't think we ever did property tax abatements, but I could loan you money interest-free in more ways. So you walk in, and I give you a swag bag. What I learned real quickly was, Oh, oh in, in workers' comp, we'd help you with that, and we'd help you with regulations and stuff. What I learned real quickly was, you know, the first question an employer would ask me was they would ask me about the education system. And they asked me about the education system for two reasons, and this goes directly to Pauli. They asked me about the education system for an overt reason, because they want to know what the quality of the workforce is going to be. Are they suitable to wor work? You know, how much time and money am I going to have to spend training them? And are they trainable? That was the overt reason. What's the covert question they had? Because if I'm sending my children to West Virginia, or I'm asking my friends whom I work with every day to move to West Virginia, I want to know what kind of schools they're in. And so I quickly learned that the single greatest economic development package in our state was the K-12 system followed by the higher ed system. Why did I work so hard on the Promise Scholarship? Because it was about retaining students at home and, uh, and people understanding that if they worked hard and got the requisite grades, they would be able to go. And incidentally, not just the promise, but also the, the uh, 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 heap and heaf, those scholarships have meant that we have, we retain, if I can keep you in West Virginia to go to higher, in, into WVU, our institution of higher education, 80% of you will stay. And that's the single greatest asset that we can have in this state. We raised the college going rate to 36%. We're still, unfortunately, and I noticed you cited this in an article, uh, Josh, we, we went from, unfortunately, we're still, I believe, we're still 50th in the nation per capita in four-year degrees. I can't correct, I can't change history, but what we can do is ch begin altering the future. And so the college going rate is now 36, we're th 36 in the nation. Now we've got to work on persistence. Anyway, subject for another day. Uh, so, but let's talk, when we're talking about inputs, let's talk about teacher preparation and what teachers need. And treating them as professionals that they truly are and providing them the professional learning communities uh, that, that are so important. This, this country, not just West Virginia, this country of all the developed nations requires our teachers to be on the feet in the classroom more hours than any other nation. Every other nation gives more hours of, for professional collaboration. Think of the times that you spent working with each other uh, in study circles and things like that and how valuable that's been. What about if they told you, here are 15 files, uh, and go down to the courthouse and just argue all day? So what, what is it that we can be doing to address that? School consolidation, sometimes necessary. There's no way around it. But do we also now have the technology to assist uh, some schools that are centers of their communities to stay open that we didn't have 15 years ago in, in which Pauli actually drove some schools to consolidate. I was in Idaho one time, fairly rural as well, I was in Idaho one time and a teacher, I'm making a presentation on blended learning and a teacher came up to me and said, they say if we introduce technology in our school, and this was a very remote part of remote Idaho, if they, we introduce technology in our schools, then in our school, then we're gonna have to close our school. And I was thinking back to my experience and told her the reality is that if you don't have the proper technology in your school, that school definitely will close because you're not able to offer the students what they want. And that's what Pauli was about. Now we do have the opportunities f to enhance the teacher, the role of the teacher. Um, third, the primary focus of funding should be on what the individual student needs to succeed. And I've lost track. West Virginia schools funding formula is always one of the most complex uh, is it still seven steps? And Don, I see you back there and others that know this very, very well. Um, 
I realized very quickly that there were only three people in the entire state of West Virginia that understood the state funding formula. Uh, that's why they were so much in demand. Uh, and they held the keys to the temple, but I know this, is that it's not weighted enough in terms of what our individual student needs. Uh, you low and, so, and so here's a proposal that I'd also like to make, and it was actually discussed by uh, Zoe and others in, the, in a previous panel. And so a thorough and efficient education, education doesn't begin with just walking into the school, because each one of us brings into that school whomever we are and whatever our environment is. And so is there now a grounds, building upon Pauli, building upon the REC decisions, building upon other uh, litigation, is there a grounds to argue that uh, a thorough and efficient education requires a whole child approach, Rec looking at what it is that that child needs to be truly able to learn to the maximum of their ability. So what kind of service, for instance, what about mental health? What, ever tried sitting uh, for an exam or uh, listening patiently in class when your teeth hurt? What about, uh, or you're not feeling well, or you're hungry? And so, and then, can that then lead in turn to what was described earlier as a braiding of services so that rather than having social services strung out all over a county, what we're doing is consolidating them at a point of contact, perhaps the school, perhaps the community center, but what we're doing is recognizing the whole child. Now, does the whole child sound like something new age or um, really squishy and soft and out there? Well, it's pretty new. John Dewey was writing about it in 1898. Uh, and as well as a whole other line of uh, educational scholars. So, and to those who may be thinking, oh, Bob, there you go. We always knew that down deep you were one of those liberal do-gooders. Um, I would argue that this is the most conservative thing you could do because for the first time you're taking services and combining them and making them cost effective and delivered at a point of contact as opposed to ineffectively across several different agencies. Do you know how, uh, I did an audit, and I promise, but I'm going to wind it up pretty soon. Uh, um, I did an audit when I asked an audit. I didn't do the audit. I convened Children's Cabinet 2001. These are the department heads that have jurisdiction over some programs affecting children, education, Medicaid, juvenile justice. And I said, how many programs do we have in the state that serve children? Nobody knew. So we went back and we did, I don't know, and, and I call it an audit, maybe it's an evaluation. Anyway, we did an analysis, came back, took two or three months. We had 267 separate programs in the state of West Virginia that affect children. 267 separate lines of funding. 267 different delivery systems. Now every one of them was well-intentioned, but they built up over 30 or 40 years, and now what we've got is this mishmash across agencies. That's not cost effective. So the most conservative thing you can do is braid those together and make sure that that child who's in that school is getting those services in the most effective way so that that in turn maximizes their learning opportunities. So the Pauli decision attempted to equalize and improve the conditions physical and ac academic for all West Virginia students. And, in, and as Judge Rack noted in 2003, this was the best tool he had at the time. So if he, if, Pauli were being filed today, would there be new grounds to argue? I suggest that emerging data and research and using the science of learning, where great gains have been made in just the last decade, would guide, should guide today's policy decisions. Some quick thoughts. Traditional concepts of equity are now inextricably joined with economic imperative. If you've got 50% of your children in this country who are children of race, color, ethnicity, and or low income, that's not just it's not just a moral imperative, which it always has been, it's an economic imperative too, because they are the, not only the workforce, but they're also the consumers of the future. When you're a lawyer, they're not gonna be, folks making 15 bucks an hour aren't gonna be walking into your office, unless you were like my office, which was legal aid. They're not gonna be able to walk into your office. And so it, we have an economic, an equity and an economic imperative that are now inextricably enjoined. I like to say, for the first time, the Bible and the billfold, right there, one, one, one and the same. The research, second, in, if you're going to pursue policy or litigation, study the research about the importance of early childhood development. That's longstanding research. 
But be aware that there's now a whole body of research emerging on the, the fact that adolescence is its own unique period of development. And that has great ramifications for the decisions you're gonna make on secondary schools. We can't just love kids now until they're seven or eight. We gotta love them all the way through. And so the science of learning should be guiding a lot of our policy and our practice decisions. And speaking of secondary schools and preparation, once again, uh, each child has unique needs. And so using data, technology, and, and uh, to develop those learning pathways is critical. Once again, looking at the tools and training that our teachers need and require. This is a profession. It is not a trade. It is a profession. And teachers have been forced in many times to conduct themselves as a trade union because they said, their trade unions are making the money and we're not. That was 50s and 60s. This is a profession and we ought to treat it as such, pay as such, and recognize that this teacher is not only the one working with our children, but also working with our economic future. And so finally, in speaking one more time on that teacher, a friend of mine was in Singapore and he got me on an education visit, got into a cab and asked to go uh, to the, be driven to the Ministry of Education. Singapore is about the size of West Virginia in terms of land, actually half the size of West Virginia in terms of land, about twice the size in population. And so the cab driver said without, oh, you're going to the Ministry of Education. Teachers, they're, they're our nation builders. Teachers are, and educators are our nation builders and our state builders here. And that's what Pauli, I think the message of Pauli continues. So in closing, sometimes one of the most blessed words a former politician can say. In closing, Pauli may not have led to an explosion of greatly improved student learning outcomes, NAEP results, other test scores, unfortunately. But then again, I haven't seen that explosion take place in other parts of the country either. Some places better than others. But we have seen high school graduation rates increase. We've seen college going rates increase. Uh, early, our West Virginia does have one of the more, most effective early childhood four-year programs in the nation, uh, nationally recognized. We've got a lot more to do. But what Pauli has done is focus on the importance of education and establish basic principles and guidelines for asserting what should be a thorough and efficient education. And most importantly, what Pauli has done is recognize that while the need for quality education remains constant, what constitutes a quality education what constitutes a quality education and how it is measured is always changing. And our students and the future of the state require the best of the constant and also the changing. Thank you very much for your interest. Thank you, that was excellent, Governor. Uh, we're gonna adjourn now and uh, reconvene in the event hall for lunch and the keynote speaker.